On the 18th of October, 1081, a battle was fought outside the walls of the Byzantine city of Dyrrhachium, then the capital of the imperial province of Illyria, and one of the most important seaports on the Adriatic. On the one side stood the recently appointed Eastern Roman Emperor, Alexius Comnenus, a former army officer who had forced his way into power just six months previously amidst catastrophic invasions from opportunistic enemies on all sides of the realm. Ever since the terrible defeat at Manzikert in 1071, where the Eastern Romans had lost practically all of their lands in Asia Minor to the Seljuk Turks, the empire had stood on the verge of collapse. Yet the Turks weren't the only enemy that Komnenos faced. Another opportunistic group had recently made themselves known on his western borders. Unlike the Turks, these warriors were Christians, yet they were no less concerned with the long-time survival of the Empire as the Turks were, and possibly even more obsessed with looting, plundering and carving out Byzantine lands for themselves. So it was on that fateful day in October 1081 that Robert Guiscard, the foremost commander of the Normans in Italy, engaged Alexius Comnenus in battle. Just as the Normans, many of whom were in fact conscripted Italians and Lombards, forced to fight for their new overlords, looked like they were ready to break in the face of the Imperial Army, the elite Byzantine Varangian Guard charged forwards to mop up the enemy. Armed with huge battle axes, the Varangians had traditionally been made up of Scandinavian and Rus adventurers in the pay of the Emperor. But in recent years, since the Norman conquest of England in 1066, large numbers of them were in fact Anglo-Saxons exiled from their homeland. It was then, just as the battle looked to be turning in the favour of the Byzantines, that a devastating Norman cavalry charge thundered into the now separated Varangians. In a tragic repeat of the events of Hastings some 15 years before, where at least some of those present on both sides may have actually fought. The Varangians were massacred to a man. Allegedly, a few survivors made it into the church of the Archangel Michael in the city, but were barricaded inside it and burnt to death in a final insult. The leader of those Norman knights was Guiscard's bastard son, Bohemund of Taranto, a ruthless giant of a man if the sources are to be believed, and one of the most effective battlefield commanders of the age. Not just content to command the vanguard in the army of his father, or another Norman lord, Bohemund sought to emulate his father's own feats, and those of his own kinsmen back in Normandy, by carving out his own lands on foreign shores. By the early 1100s, two decades after the Battle of Dyrrhachium, Bohemund had not only found himself playing an integral role in the largest military expedition since the fall of the Western Roman Empire, but he had also achieved his goals in not only carving himself out a kingdom, but also establishing a dynasty that would outlast both his fathers back in Italy and his kinsman William the Conquerors in England. The First Crusade was about to begin. At the time of Bohemund's birth, in around 1054, southern Italy had been the domain of various Lombard princes, Byzantine regional administrators, and Norman mercenaries since the turn of the millennium. It was these Norman swords for hire, the descendants of Vikings who had settled in northern France in the early 10th century, that would eventually capitalise on instability in the region to carve themselves out various political entities, and eventually, a kingdom. Bohemund's father, Robert Guiscard, a minor landless knight from a backwater part of Normandy, had travelled to Italy in 1047 with just a handful of warriors. Whilst there, he had initially been the leader of a group of brigands, making a living out of robbing and banditry. His elder brothers, William and Drogo, had already built up contacts for themselves in the region, 
and carved themselves out a small stronghold from where they conducted further raids and battles against the neighbouring Lombard, Byzantine and Arab lords of the region. Yet Giscard could expect no handouts from his kinsmen. That simply wasn't the Norman way. Through a combination of his own sheer force of will, his cunning, his brutality and the deaths of various competitors, including all of his older brothers, by the late 1050s, Giscard emerged as the foremost power in southern Italy, succeeding in solidifying the various statelets into a single principality. Giscard's first son, Bohemund, had been born in Italy during his father's early years as a robber baron. His mother was a Norman, and probably a relatively close relative to his father. As such, when Giscard became a close ally of the Pope, he was advised to distance himself from this marriage and subsequently remarried a Lombard noblewoman named Sikulgita. This made Bohemund a bastard, and Giscard's son with his new wife, Roger, his legitimate heir. Though Bohemund received a knightly education and remained close to his father, he was disinherited of any lands he may have hoped to gain upon his father's death. Nonetheless, the two remained close, and Bohemund proved himself to be an able-bodied fighter from a young age. In 1079, Bohemund took part in the first battle in his lengthy career, during a rebellion of various Norman barons against his father. The rebellion was swiftly put down, although southern Italy remained in a state of almost perpetual war as various competing powers fought for supremacy. In the early 1080s, Giscard sought to extend his realm even further, this time across the Adriatic Sea against the ailing power of the Byzantines who looked on the verge of total collapse at the time. Bohemund landed in early 1081 at the head of an advance guard aimed to pave the way for Giscard's arrival later in the year. Bohemund probably commanded some of the finest troops that the Normans had to offer. They were veteran warriors blooded in the perpetual battlegrounds of southern Italy. Bohemund and his men rampaged around the coast for several months before capturing the town of Valona. They also sailed to Corfu, but chose to not invade as the local garrison heavily outnumbered them. By May, Giscard arrived with the rest of the army, possibly as many as 20 or 30,000 men, many of whom had been forcibly conscripted. There, they besieged the town of Dyrrhachium and won a decisive victory against Alexius's army when he arrived to relieve the siege in October. Father and son continued to rampage along the Adriatic coast for the next three years, variously taking it in turns to return to Italy for reinforcements, as Comnenus barely clung on to some semblance of control by stirring up rebellions against Giscard's always money-hungry commanders on both sides of the sea. Finally, by 1084, an epidemic decimated the Norman army and forced both commanders back to Italy by December. Giscard's death, just a few months later in July 1085, caused a succession crisis in southern Italy, and also effectively saved the western Byzantine lands from total conquest. Robert's Lombard wife, Sikulgita, and most of the Norman nobility supported her son, Roger Borsa, a half-Lombard that they argued would bring the two cultures together and bring peace to the region, once and for all. Bohemund, of course, wasn't about to lay down without a fight. He regarded himself as his father's lawful heir, and he was more than willing to fight for this claim. After making an alliance with his one-time enemy, Jordan of Capua, and various other local lords, he began to capture and raid Roger's towns one by one, threatening to plunge the region into all-out war once again. Finally, later in the year, the two half-brothers met at their father's tomb at Venosa to reach a compromise under the terms of their agreement, Bohemund received Taranto, Aurea, Otranto, Brindisi and Gallipoli, but acknowledged Roger Borsa's overall authority over the region. After building up his forces once more, Bohemund again renewed the feud with his brother in the autumn of 1087, and anarchy reigned in many areas for another decade to come. In 1097, Bohemund was campaigning against various rebellious lords in Amalfi, when he came into contact with crusaders fired up by the religious fervour passing through his territories on their way to Constantinople. 
Despite the fact that he had spent much of his life engaged in a state of almost perpetual war with the Byzantines, Bohemund decided to take part in this vast religious crusade that had been called by the Pope, Urban II, at the Council of Clermont two years previously, in order to lend aid to the Byzantines against Seljuk Turkic attacks from the east. Whilst it seems possible that Bohemund did genuinely have some kind of a religious epiphany when he heard of the expedition being formed by princes from all over Europe, it is also entirely likely that he knew an opportunity when he saw one. Like his father before him, he wished to carve himself out an entirely new realm, and one in the rich lands of the East would do nicely. In reference to this, the contemporary chronicler Geoffrey Malaterra bluntly stated that Bohemund took the cross with the intention of plundering and conquering Greek lands. Bohemund gathered a large Norman army, possibly one of the finest in the crusading host. And together they crossed the Adriatic Sea, along the same route that he had previously plied in the early 1080s, at the side of his father. Upon arriving at Constantinople in April 1097, he paid homage to Alexius, who might be forgiven for being unnerved by the sudden arrival of as many as 60,000 battle-hardened warriors directly outside his capital, many of whom had previously pillaged his lands just over a decade before as part of Guiscard's plan to take the Byzantine throne. Of course, Alexius had sent out a call for aid, but likely hoped for a small group of mercenaries, not the vast and unwieldy army that he received. After some brief negotiations, Alexius quickly ferried the army across the Bosphorus into Asia Minor and unleashed them upon the Turks. After conquering the city of Nicaea for the Empire, the Crusaders continued on in the midsummer of 1097 through the harsh, unforgiving plains of Anatolia. Due to his decades of military experience, Bohemund quickly established himself as the de facto leader of the expedition, forming the vanguard of the army alongside his distant kinsman, Robert Curtos, the Duke of Normandy and eldest son of William the Conqueror. It says much for Bohemund's leadership that the First Crusade succeeded in crossing Asia Minor, where the later Crusades of 1101, 1147 and 1189 all failed to do so. The greatest challenge came at Dorylaeum, when Bohemund's 20,000 strong force was ambushed by the Sultan of Rum, Kilij Arslan just one of the Seljuk successor states that had carved up Asia Minor after they conquered it from the Byzantines in the latter half of the 11th century. Bohemund found himself up against an exceptionally mobile Eastern army for the first time, and could do little but form a solid defensive position against the roughly 8,000 strong force of mounted horse archers that appeared like a deluge from the Anatolian plains. Nevertheless, Bohemund and Robert managed to hold strong and by the time the rest of the 30,000 Crusaders under Godfrey of Bouillon and Raymond of Toulouse arrived, he led the charge against the Turks, forcing them into a full retreat and winning the day. The Crusade then continued on until it eventually arrived late in the year at the walls of Antioch, a former provincial capital of the Byzantines, now in Turkic hands. A long siege ensued with various counter-attacks attempted by the other Seljuk successor states eventually being driven back by Bohemund and the other commanders, whilst they simultaneously fought to keep supplies coming in from the Genoese ships at the nearby port of St. Simeon. Finally, in June, the city fell, and Bohemund, much to the horror of the Byzantines and several of the other Crusader lords, most notably Raymond of Toulouse, claimed it as his own, installing himself as the new prince of the city and its surrounding territories much to the irritation of the Byzantines, who had themselves owned the city until its capture by the Seljuks just recently in 1084. The rest of the Crusader army continued on to Jerusalem, whilst Bohemund set himself up in Antioch as a ruthless Norman lord, much as he had back in Italy. In 
In 1100, however, as he attempted to exploit regional instabilities in Cilician Armenia in order to expand his territories, he was defeated in battle and captured by the Danish Mens, another successor state to the Seljuks who held sway in eastern Anatolia. Bohemund was kept in chains in a dungeon until he was finally ransomed back in 1103 by his nephew and erstwhile right-hand man, Tancred, who had ruled Antioch in his stead. Nevertheless, just like his father before him, ever the restless warlord, he didn't stay in the city for long. In the mid-1100s, Bohemund left his principality to travel to Northern Europe in order to raise more money and support for a campaign against the Turks. This new crusade, which is almost forgotten today, proved to be incredibly popular and roused up support from all over Europe. It was so popular that Bohemund was actually refused entrance into England by King Henry I, as he couldn't risk losing the huge amounts of manpower that it was predicted would answer the call. His newfound status also won him the hand of Constance, the daughter of the French king, Philip I, an impressive feat for a bastard son of a landless Norman knight. After rousing up a great deal of support and fervor, he decided to instead use this force against the Byzantines, who he attacked in 1107. Yet, times had changed for the empire since the early 1080s. Alexius Comnenus had overseen a quite remarkable restoration of power. This newfound strength, coupled with the success of the First Crusade, having taken pressure off the empire from the east, meant that the imperial army was able to meet Bohemund head on, blockading him in the city of Dyrrhachium, place of his victory the last time the two men faced off close to 30 years before. And this time, Alexius had allies, an impressive fleet of Venetian war galleys that loomed over the city from the harbour, threatening to not just destroy Bohemund's ambitions, but end his life as well. By 1108, after extensive fighting against Alexius, who still sought to reclaim Antioch back into the empire, a combined Byzantine and Venetian army proved too powerful to defeat, and Bohemund, having no other choice, reluctantly agreed to become a vassal of the Byzantines, receiving the title Sebastos and being forced to admit a Greek patriarch into the city. Antioch remained a unique enclave of Latin and Greek Christianity in the East, and a major player in the various wars and crusades to come over the next 200 years. Bohemund died a broken man in Europe, before ever returning back to Antioch. He was succeeded by his and Constance's infant son, Bohemund II, under the tutelage of his erstwhile lieutenant, Tancred de Hauteville, who became the new power in the city. Though by the end of his life, Bohemund may have viewed himself as a failure, having been defeated by his longtime adversary, Alexius Comnenus, and being forced into submission by the Byzantines. The Latin dynasty that he established survived there for longer than his family members in Italy and his kinsmen in England. His descendants would continue to struggle against Byzantine overlordship and the various Islamic powers of the region, playing off both against the other for close to two centuries, until the Principality of Antioch was finally stamped out of existence by the Mamluks of Egypt in 1268.